I don't need that. All right. This is the presentation. Thanks very much, Mark, and welcome to everybody. It's great to see such a uh, strong turnout and, yeah, exciting times to start a process of collaborating and working together to uh, work through the common issues that we have in developing camel industry in Australia. So I'm here to talk to you about the 10-year R&D plan for developing the the Australian camel milk industry. Now this was really developed with Julie Bird, uh, but it is appropriate that uh, I stand up and in front of the plan because it will be me that you'll be dealing with as we move forward in the relationship with Redix. So, uh, but I very much thank Julie Bird for all of her efforts and many, she'll be known to many of you and she'll be with us later in the day. Uh, Right button. But before we start, I'd like to, uh, to on the plan, I'd like to just tell you some something of the context of uh, RERDIC and the Rural Industries Research and Development Corporation. This slide represents some of the things that RERDIC do. So we are involved in the development of new and emerging industries, and that's where the camel milk industry would fit in. We are involved in some levy paying industries with a research and development corporation for those industries who don't have their own research and development corporation. So that's chicken meat, rice, uh, honeybees, uh, tea tree oil now, and buffalo, kangaroo, uh, ginger. These are industries that have managed to get themselves uh, over the hump <laughs> to um, a uh, become a levy paying industry so I certainly hope that's a hump that becomes within the sights of the camel industry. Uh, yeah. So uh, we also have a program in investing in people, so students, this is the Horizons program uh, and that's really important for developing industries that you look at the human beings involved because Developing industries is really about looking after the people who are involved in the industry and uh, making money for people who are involved in the industry. And we celebrate uh, as particularly uh, the role of women in agriculture. And uh, there is, on the 13th of September, the uh, Women in Agriculture Awards Dinner will be held in the Grand Hall in Parliament House in Canberra. And it would be fantastic to have a, a table of camel industry people. Uh, this is the first year that the, that, in, that event has been opened up more widely than to just the participants. So we're hoping that a lot of our stakeholders in Rodic can join us and see the breadth of activities that Redick is involved with in that gala dinner in the Grand Hall of Parliament House on 13th of September. So where we see agriculture going, we have a very strong relationship with the, the National Farmers Federation and the National Farmers Federation have a view of agriculture as a $100 billion turnover industry by 2030 and so that would mean an increase from our current $60 billion turnover uh, in that period. And we, when we look at, uh, yep, so at the moment there's 1.6 million people employed in agriculture, 300,000 directly employed, exports worth $45 billion. Uh, it's the biggest rural, big, biggest employer in rural and regional communities. This is the space that, that Redick is operating in. And we also have programs that deal with issues that cross agriculture. So we coordinate amongst the other RDCs to deal with issues across all of agriculture. Now, when we think about the new and emerging industries, this is a, a plot of agriculture for the last 40 years. And the traditional industries uh, grow, and they tend to grow, but most of the growth has come from these other category here, which tends to be the new and emerging industries. So that's why we uh, folk programs and efforts in industries like camel industry are particularly important because that's where the growth can come from. In the context of what's happening in the world, we conducted some studies with CSIRO to look at the 
particular trends that are important for agriculture in the in the near future uh, and this is a a culmination of quite a lot of work from CSIRO and a disciplined methodology. Uh, but the trends that are relevant to us in a developing world are a hungrier world, population growth is a driver of demand, a wealthier world, the new middle class in emerging economies is a really important driver for our future. We have more choosy customers, particularly empowered by technologies that enable them to see their way through to production systems and understand what they're eating. Uh, and transformative technologies will transform the way we relate to our customers, but it will also tr transform our production systems. So we're looking at transformative technologies in some deeper way. And the, it's going to be a bumpier ride with globalisation driving everything in the world, every industry in a global context. So these are some mega trends that, uh, of all the trends that they, they looked at, this was uh, the driving ones that are relevant to us in Australian agriculture. And it is agriculture does provide significant competitive advantage to Australia at the moment. So this is a plot of Australia's advantage versus the global opportunity and we have high advantage and there's a strong opportunity and the size of these bubbles is the size of the opportunities. It's a, a small dot but a small dot in a global sense make, can make a very big impact for Australia. So uh, it's a strategic priority for Australia as well. So transformative technologies, I think technology, uh, we have a, pr a program looking at transformative technologies and interested in how ag tech can be brought to bear in our industries and this will change everything in the world and it's a, a driving trend here and how these things can be adapted into your industry is something that uh, uh, we can bring to bear as a cross-industry uh, program within Redic. So this is perhaps points to some of the value add for being involved with Redic beyond just the uh, programs that we can uh, develop, especially for your industry. But these will take adapt adaptation for each industry and for each situation. So a snap, a snapshot of the future where we'll be dealing with the next generation of rural leaders, this technology explosion, uh, particularly grappling at Redick, we're grappling with the private sector investment. We've been a R&D corporation, very focused on, on research, but we're realising increasingly that to, to get rapid development in the industries that are providing the opportunities that Australia needs to execute on, we need to involve the private sector and uh, uh, particularly investment communities. Uh, strengthening international ties helps us deal with the globalising world and it's fantastic to see such a great lineup of speakers today to help us strengthen those international ties. And collaboration will boost the competitive advantage. There are lots of things that people have, problems that people in an industry have in common and the smaller producers uh, have the same sorts of uh, problems as the greater producers and as an industry your reputation is reliant on one another and so that can be important for, for positioning so it's, uh, it, there's lots of reasons to be collaborative uh, and yep camel milk will be a new rural industry. In working through our plans we've got a new CEO and a new chairman in Kay Hull and John Harvey and so they've recently updated our five-year plan and in consulting the five-year plan we've particularly focused on a, a cohort of new and emerging leaders, the uh, young people who are going to be involved in the future of agriculture. So we're particularly looking at uh, their view of the future and the idea that uh, they'll re the young people require some mentoring to come through the system, but also that they have uh, digital native capabilities and they'll probably change us rather than us changing them. 
and so it's a perspective of the future that's driven some of the uh, elements, well, most of the elements of the uh, five-year plan for RUDIC heading forward. So our mission is to grow the long-term prosperity of Australian rural industries and regional communities. We have, yep, these four arenas, people and leadership, national challenges and opportunities, farm profitability, and what we're talking about today, a new emerging industry. And how are we doing this? We're being connected, innovative, delivering results and building partnerships and collaborations uh, and building a performance culture. We actually want to execute on the opportunities that are present for Australia and continuously improving our business practices. So to the 10-year plan for the camel industry, this uh, slide outlines the development of the 10-year plan. We identified an opportunity and then found people to contract to develop the 10-year plan and that was AgriKnowledge and it was delivered to Redick in uh, August 2016. So once we had that plan as a Redick document, we were able to consult with uh, leaders in the camel industry as to what would be uh, a process for uh, starting to invest in that plan. And yeah, in, so this, that's, that's led to this forum. I guess. Um, so this was just to give a sense of how we invest in industries at different stages of development. So early in the development of an industry, it's appropriate for us to put strategic investments in where it's 100% uh, ready contribution and but in, there's always an increasing expectation of co-contribution cash and in kind from industry and we also want that in the context of the growth investments for the industry uh, voluntary levies often happen as an industry develops where the an industry can say well we'll chip in everybody chip in and we can fund some research and uh, uh, as industries develop to get a more secure base for their their R and D needs, then a statutory levy is an option. And but that really can't be considered until turnover is sort of somewhere between ten and twenty million dollars, because the collection costs are taken out of that levy fund. And so it's important that you uh, consider that when the time is right. But then you have more control over your own destiny in terms of funding your research needs. So the priorities in the 10-year plan, essentially they boil down to productivity and awareness workshops, which is, this will be one of those. Uh, although I did note that in, uh, there's a, some enthusiasm to have hands-on work workshops as well. Uh, nutrition and breeding were the three priorities that drive out of the 10-year the plan. Noticeably absent from the plan was any mention of marketing or an industry executive office. Now, Redick specifically is excluded from dealing with promotional activity, so we won't be involved in that. That's not to say that it's not very important for the development of the industry. The way that camel milk is positioned in consumers' mind, minds is vitally important for the development of the industry. It's just not something that we can do. Uh, and an industry executive office, that's also something that we can't do. So they are uh, deliberately absent from the plan and uh, yeah, notably so. So, yeah, to look in more detail, the, this is the first priority, is to increase awareness of the critical issues associated with acquiring, training and managing camels for maximising productivity in the Australian camel milk industry. So this is about people and investing in people and the skills and capabilities of the people in the industry. So recognising that people are very important to being uh, the human capital in understanding how to deal with camels is important. 
So the second priority was understanding nutrition and feeding. Uh, hang on. Yeah, uh, within the objective one, there was also mention of the five freedoms. Uh, so animal welfare is going to be a particularly important part of the underpin the success of the industry. So a very important part to be thinking of. Uh, training and awareness of advanced requirements in camel farming. Uh, and disease management, so biosecurity is also uh, an important aspect there. Yeah, nutrition, that's objective two, and objective three, uh, selective breeding. And uh, in this area, it talks about the initial wild selection, trait selection, artificial insemination, and embryo transfer as technologies and parts of the process of uh, developing uh, better breeds of cattle for milking. So, yep, that was the priorities of the 10-year plan. So this for forum is to address priority one, uh, but it also is a starting point for addressing other priorities. So congratulations to Mark, Michael and F Phil for drawing the this program together. Uh, hopefully this gets over our first hump for getting us into uh, working well with the camel industry and I really look forward to executing on the opportunities that are present. Thank you Duncan. Um, but just uh what add a couple of quick things. Uh, firstly, um, the uh, I, if I hadn't mentioned before to you, uh, I should now. We are recording this session, um, and if anyone objects to that, uh, let me know, um, and we can perhaps edit you out. Uh, the reason for that is that uh, Redick have agreed with us that uh, we'll put up a website uh, out. At the end of this forum, uh, probably uh, later in the month, or early next month, and uh, the talks will go up on the website. All speakers, uh, with all the speakers' approval. So for the speakers today, there is a uh, consent form. I think Michael's spoken with you about um, that we'll need if it goes up on a public site. Uh, whether that's a login, Duncan, for industry members or public. We'll sort through that. Might talk with you about that later. Yeah. Okay, a free, maybe more likely a free access. Okay, so keep that in mind. So we'll be recording um, the speakers and the uh, Q and A or discussion forums. Although the camera will stay pointed at the speaker during the Q and A and any panel responses to the group. We won't be swinging it around in case you. Some of you fellas here need to put a bit more makeup on. Don't worry. Yeah, that's right. It's too late for a couple. Um, so uh, what I'll do now is uh, I think um, I'd just like to give uh, you an opportunity in the group to ask Duncan any questions around uh, the directions and what what really can respond with now. Given that we're recording, once again, we won't put the video on you, we'll just keep it on Duncan. That's why we've dressed up, because we know the video's on. Uh, but Michael's got a microphone, still want to hear you. Uh, so uh, if you have a question, just raise your hand. We'll try to do this in an orderly fashion. Thank you. Yeah, Pat, I'd be particularly interested in perhaps some feedback on the aspects of the, the priorities in the plan. and. Uh, if anybody had particular questions as to how the plan was developed, I'll tick, perhaps tic-tac with you, Mark, as well, on, on those questions, because uh, as you've done the consultation. Did you have any comments you would like to add to this? Uh, Michael, you can go ahead. Yeah, I mean, many, but not, not just now. Yeah, happy for the time being. Is 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 the plan set in stone now? Because many of us weren't involved or asked to contribute. 
on the questionnaire. We weren't given a questionnaire. So is it a, is it a set and stone plan or is it something that is dynamic and can evolve over time as more of us get to talk to each other and we get to collaborate both with each other and ROIRDC? Yep. It, sure. Sure. Yeah, um, look, at the time uh, we had limited information to go by so we did cast the net out as well as we could and it started with asking people who knew of other dairies so inevitably it didn't get to everybody, I do know that um, and, and I apologise for that but that, that's just where we were at at the stage. Uh, we did our best to try to get out there um, and, and even today we've got people who uh, starting dairies now who didn't hear about this forum till the last minute and once again it's really difficult when there's no formal way we can contact people uh, except look through the white pages and yellow pages and all the rest of it. So uh, I, I think to answer your question this is a dynamic process and, and, and this was just a start point in trying to set an agenda and I think very much that what should come out of this forum uh, and there's a session right at the end tomorrow is redefining that somewhat and what are the future directions so that that I think this is the place to really set the future for the development of this industry that was just a start point but, uh, having said that some of the things are from our point of view are not very changeable so in that in that we can't invest in marketing so if it's our money that's going in we can't invest in marketing and we can't also invest in the industry organisations as much as we appreciate an industry being organised and being able to get along and work out uh, how to relate to us that's really important to us but we actually don't uh, have a capacity to invest in that uh, political infrastructure I guess but it's important that it's done well one thing specifically is market access, so I don't know how, if everyone realises but camel milk is not one of the milks that's allowed for import into China. They've got mare's milk, goat milk and cow, like bovine milk, but camel milk's not a product that's allowed to go cross-border into China. That was a big oversight in the free trade agreement, wasn't it? Uh, <laughs> if they had have asked us, we would have all said put it in. So, you know, does RIRDC have an ability to work with the Department of Ag and um, the equivalent of AQUIS in China to help with that? Is that, I think, because I said market access should be one of the... <coughs> yeah, thanks for that. We'll add that to the list. And interest, I'm not sure what the best pathway to address that uh, missing link is. Uh, sometimes those things can have a research component if there's a particular requirement on the other end and that tends to be something that we can invest in. Uh, so uh, that's a possibility. In terms of marketing too, often an industry will develop uh, some quality assurance program which guarantees some level of quality uh, and th those things can often underpin a marketing effort and we have been involved in, in investing in those things on behalf of an industry. So if that was something the industry uh, felt was useful to underpin a marketing effort, but market access, we've definitely invested in those sorts of things in the past. Um, just another question on uh, regarding uh, meat the meat industry, I think the biggest, I suppose, one of the, you know, when you're getting feral animals and training them, breaking them in, if there's not a, a meat outlet to a dairy industry, I, I just didn't see anything up there on that, on the development of the meat market in that plan. Um, look, I very much appreciate the fact that uh, it's got to be a close collaboration between camel milk industry and the meat industry. Um, the, and, and I've just completed a, I don't know, 80 page study on the camel meat industry for the Chief Ministers of SA and NT to that effect. Um, we did invite to this forum um, SAMEX uh, as at the moment the, the main meat producing, camel meat producing outlet in Australia. It's not the only one but it's, it's the biggest at I think about 10,000 camels per annum. Um, Gary very much wanted to be here. I don't know if Simon's coming. Is that do you know whether Simon's going to be able to make it? Um, 
but he, he got called unexpectedly overseas. So that the invitation to uh, particularly SAMEX was important, I thought, because that collaboration needs to be there. Now, there are other operators, and there are some um, uh, camel milk, uh, burgeoning, shall we call them, um, camel milk operations that will incorporate meat in their operations. So um, I'm aware of two or three that are coming, may come on board in the next 12 months where it's going to be, an in they, they believe they just need to do an integrated job of that within their organisation. I don't know if yours is one of those. I think that's something we could put down as an imp as important issue and discuss that throughout this forum, how that's going to work and, th and that collaboration. Um, it wasn't a priority, immediate priority in this this ten year plan. At the time when we consulted with those people, I think the general belief was that was an operational issue. But if the general group here believes that should be brought into this discussion, I think it, it's important to do that. Uh, Chris O'Hora from Calamunda Camels, Duncan. Um, thank you very much for allowing the presentation to take place. Um, my question relates to research in the developing acceptance and legislation of camel milk. Um, it's a product that's below the radar but high on the um, reaction part of legislation. And to rather than have the legislators prevent us from getting camel milk into the industry, under many different variants, whether it's raw or pasteurised or, or export um, products. Um, a, a quantity of research needs to be done to prove to the legislators the statistics of what we have as a raw or pasteurised product. Does Riddick see itself as being able to assist in getting that research done? <coughs> Uh, is this, I'm um, just tease out the question again, is it, uh, you're asking a question about market access to the Australian market? No, primarily what we find is that the health departments have a knee-jerk reaction to a product, i.e. camel milk in the industry, and uh, state legislators are making decisions to prevent that uh, product from being sold in shops, for example. Now they won't change their view unless of course they have the data to prove that that is a, a product that is acceptable to the health regulation department. Now that's years and years of, of research to get that point. Um, the industry itself is a young and, and growing industry. Um, the data that we have individually from the organisers and producers is there, but it's not recognised in whole from the health departments either state or federal. Chris, um, mate, that's good you brought that up. We just, just before we got on the flight to come here, we just signed off to invest 50 grand with the University of Queensland through an ARC grant. And I think the ARC grant puts 150,000 in. And over the next three years, um, our program with the University of Queensland is do exactly what you're just talking about. Like, what is raw camel milk? What does pasteurised camel milk look like? What's the profile of the indigenous bacteria in the milk? over time, different shelf life temperatures, the whole thing, all the information that we would need as an industry to be able to go to any, uh, to the federal and to the state bodies, uh, safe food bodies to actually, to say, you know, either put a case forward that you want to sell raw milk or put a case forward that of the shelf life that we should have on our pasteurised milk, raw, raw milk or any other product. And then you're right, it doesn't exist and or doesn't exist in a format they want to see it. So. Perhaps as part of that um, project we got with UQ, maybe we could collect data from yourself. And I, I can see these guys in South Australia seem to have some information perhaps they've done with the University of South Australia here as well. Maybe we can collate all that in one spot and have one, I guess, a document that we can all have access to and so on. And we, and we signed off on that to be put public all over Australia and the world. So we had the opportunity to keep it to ourselves. We decided to just make it open to everybody. So. Uh, yeah, so I'm just imagining what this document might look like and how it would come together. Uh, and is there a... Often, often codes of practice or quality systems that an industry develops that has a standard 
that says, well, I'm a member of the camel milk and uh, I abide by the industry code of practice uh, can be helpful for um, those sort of assurances. Um, have we got one of those? No? I'm not sure if, if, if Riddick could be the, be the forum, I suppose, for a start-up industry, because uh, just discussing it around a lot of people that are doing their own individual research, like right through to the cosmetic end and all the rest of it, which takes in the market. But I suppose it's just, a, you know, whether if Riddick's the platform for, pr or provides a platform that we all communicate on, would be a, a good start to, you know, we're all doing this, you know, covering ourselves with the same research or similar research. Just quickly put two, two cents in there. Um, look, th this, this is about the R&D agenda um, and I think a great outcome of this will be whether this group sees the need for an industry body. Um, those are typically the things that an industry body would be looking at is uh, standards uh, and those sorts of higher level collaborations. Um, so I think tomorrow that's very much where we need to head is to see what this group want to do with that. Um, but immediately we, we're addressing the priorities for the R&D plan um, today and tomorrow. I think uh, there's a question yes, here. Sorry. Uh, I, I'm sorry, maybe my, my question will be naive, but I don't know Australia. But I, I'm. I make monitoring of the camel farming system and the camel production in the world. And uh, for me, Australia is a completely uh, white continent. There is no data regarding camel industry in Australia in FAO statistic uh, database, for example. So uh, my question is, okay, you, you say you will develop uh, the camel industry for the next 10 years, or the 10 years, but what is the state of the heart from from where are starting? For me, uh, Australia, it is a wild camel. I know there is some camel industry. Uh, I see movie, I see report, uh, some reports, and uh, I, I see some publication. But uh, w what is the situation of the camel farming system here? We have you have shown a slide, you know, at the beginning of the uh, powerful agriculture in Australia, but. What is the current situation of the camel farming system, the camel production in Australia? If somebody knows, I will be interested. This, this, this is a broader issue, um, but uh, certainly uh, I, uh, I think we can discuss that, perhaps informally and in the, you know, in the, in the morning teas and whatever. Um, I've certainly did a study for two chief ministers on that issue, is farming camel sustainable for particularly meat? That was the, the, the heavy focus on that study. There's mixed answers to that, depends where you are, <laughs> all right? Australia's a big continent with a lot of different land systems. So um, the, the biggest issue for camel meat, and I don't want to speak about this too much, it's not what we're about today, is just getting them out of there. Right, the heavy cost associated with procuring the wild stock for farming that that that's the first issue, and then holding them there is the second issue. But it, it's a broader issue of which this group's part of. I think, as as was rightly said, is we shouldn't be working in isolation. But um, I think it's one to talk about, perhaps at the end and in the networks. Not not at this point, if that's all right. Yep. I, there was another question at the back. Yes, thanks very much. Just going back to the priority of the, <coughs> the plan in, with regards to the query, I don't want to miss... Just speak point. closer in the mic, thanks. Uh, we don't want to miss the opportunity of uh, involving transportation of camels. There's a bit of... Uh, you talked a little bit about welfare. You talked about how it... I think if you add transportation for camels, camels are different animals. They don't go using a truck, they come out using a truck, we try them, they need a lot of work and we don't want no missed opportunity of not getting the involved of the livestock carriers. They might come in the end with things that the height of the camel, the size of the camel, 
uh, you do what the weight and uh, you know the, the, the trucks has to have a minimum but anyhow from my experience transportation of climate has to be looked at in a very serious way which will protect us from animal welfare as well and the distance and the long distance and what long haul trips Finally, I'd like to uh, appreciate the recognition of the gentleman on the top there about our individual effort of working with UNSA trying to identify some characters of the camel milk. Hopefully that will be a nucleus for research to qualify us to have a little bit of data for future leg um, legislation of camel milk. Thank you. That would be good, very good. Thanks for those comments. And we've put, we've just started dot putting some things up. Transport's a big issue. It came up as a huge issue for the camel meat industry as well, for obvious reasons. And I believe, Margie Bale, are you going to be addressing that in part in your talk? Right. Not so much on there, just the problems that you see. All right. Okay, all right, okay. But it is a big issue, I grant that. Uh, anybody else want to make some comments or questions? Mike, Michael, the microphone over here to Lauren. Really just to answer Bernard, but just a brief overview. Yep. A Mark brief up. overview of the industry, just um, mainly this because... This is the camel industry... Just, just where it is, just so I can just briefly answer Bernard and just for anybody else here. Um, yes, the Australian camel industry is so the Australian camel industry is predominantly wild, and it has been, you know, since um, really and since the 1920s. But there has been there's because we're in states around Australia, there's been dis different classifications of camels in the way they've been um, managed. So in some states, say like in Queensland, they're under the Stock Act, and some other states have now changed classification to include camels now in the pastoral system. From that. The, um, particularly the camel milk industry has started to develop. Um, the wild cam in the wild camel situation, the largest um, uh, producing and uh, provision of, of camels for camel meat come from the Nanandara, which is the um, indigenous area. They are the largest camel company we believe now in the world. They have about 200,000 wild camels on their lands. They also supply camels for, um, for the dairy industry. Um, other than that, now that we've moved